welcome back and uh, so in today's class but before we actually move on let's just uh, do a quick recap of what we have done in the last class last class was important because we kind of established the 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 basis behind a primitive uh, memory unit because that's the missing piece that was missing right in in our construction of these uh, computing devices we talked about multiple different uh, building blocks and memory was a critical piece that was missing so far right and uh, in the last class we 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 came one step closer i would say many steps closer to realizing that 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 uh, unit okay and so we started out with the description of the sr latch the nor version of the sr latch okay which contains two inputs and uh, we know how that sr latch actually work performs it's a very basic fundamental uh, circuit that consists of two nor latches where uh, in which you have a feedback going from the output of one nor latch to the input of the next nor latch okay so we examined how to analyze such circuits which which feature a feedback okay from the output to the input and we also examined what is called a nand version of the latch if i if i can if i can implement a nor version of a latch i can implement i can also i should also be able to implement a nand version of the latch and this is exactly what we have done in the last class okay so we implemented a nand version of the latch and uh, so we realized that during the implementation okay uh we need two inputs two inputs are needed to store a single bit of information two in inputs are needed in this case the s and r inputs to store single bit are needed to store one bit where am i storing this one bit i can think about this the place where i'm storing it or uh, as the node that says q right i can consider the node in my diagram that you have you may have already in your books that says q because we have two outputs q and q prime the node that says q that's the node where i'm storing information okay and my s and r inputs are the source of information information and the node q is the place where i'm actually putting that information down okay all right and we also realized that we have what is called a forbidden state in both versions of the latches that we had to address and we know we, by by now we should know exactly what that forbidden state constitutes what does that mean by a forbidden state a state where i do not where my output is uh, indeterminable right because i don't know what the output is going to be let's say i'm working with billions of these you know billions of these units these are latches uh because the output depends on the speed of individual latch in individual gate constituting that latch right uh when i'm working with billions of those i exactly do not know when i apply these inputs i don't know what the output is going to be so the output is determined indeterminate and that's why we call that the forbidden state okay the state that you you don't want to work with okay and third we don't uh, again uh considering that we want to be able to build a computing device that can be programmed that can be that can work through a sequence of operations right a program with multiple steps we don't have any means of uh, doing that at this time with just a latch design we don't have that uh, that that capability a, a simple memory unit uh that we described in the last class the sr latch does not really serve the entire purpose so that critical piece is still missing a critical piece of timing that can enable me to sequence a bunch of operations the critical piece is still missing to uh, the end of the last class we made progress towards that where we we modified a nand latch okay a nand latch a simple nand latch a two nand gate nand latch was modified with two additional nand latch uh, additional la uh, nand latches uh, nand gates nand gates 
and in, we introduced a new input called the enable input. Now this enable input makes a big difference, makes a big contribution as you will see now. Okay. And we also talked about how do we, how can we think about introducing a concept of timing into a device, right? Um, and the analogy is again, as, hum we, 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 as human beings, we are, you know, we, we have a brain, we have the memory, they can perform complex operations, right? Multiple operations, and uh, and we, we we and we are programmed so that we can feel time. Again, the way we feel time is uh, through changes that happens, right? Changes that are happening as a function of time. We can actually feel that uh, the passage of time. If I want to do that, if I want to incorporate, if I want to do something that that can enable me to introduce a concept of timing into a device, right? A piece of device that's just sitting there. What should I do? I invent a signal called a clock signal, which is nothing but a, sequ a sequence of these square pulses. Okay, a continuous stream of these square pulses. Okay, and somehow I would introduce that into the device, and that's exactly how we're going to do that. We'll see that in this class. All right, and now I can talk in terms of the number of clock pulses elapsed. Okay, so that's how I would introduce the concept of timing into a into a digital device or a computing device. This, this clock pulse, and this basically determines uh, everything in terms of how fast your circuits are, how fast your computers are. The faster the clock, the, the faster your circuits can process this clock signal, the faster your computing devices are. Right, that's how the things have evolved uh, in the 1990s from megahertz or from kilohertz to now we're talking about in terms of gigahertz, right? So that's so basically my, my, the circuits that we are, or the devices, the computers or microprocessors that we are working with now can process gigahertz called uh, clock speeds. So the circuits can actually switch, uh, switch at, that, at that frequencies. Okay, so this is what uh, a quick, overview of what was done in the last class, what we still have to do, okay? Now, so I just want to start with the circuit that we completed, that basically you had the NAND latch, which consists of two NAND gates, all right? That was the S and R inputs. That's the Q and Q prime. We added, okay, let me shorten that a little bit. We added two additional uh, NAND gates to that. Again, let me just shorten that. So that's the S and R, okay. And we call this new input. We have a th third input. We call that the enable input. And the way we have solved the problem of forbidden state, that state basically happens when S and R equals one. In this particular case, when S and R inputs are equal to uh, one, the forbidden, the forbidden state arises. S and R equal to zero is the memory state. When my enable is zero, that also constitutes a memory state. So we have two memory states. We don't need really two memory states. So I can get by with just one memory state. And I can, um, so even if I lose the ability to, ability of a memory state, by uh, letting go of the condition where s equal to r equal to zero by doing this, which is still fine because I, I still have one memory state to work with. Okay, so by doing this, uh, I am letting s and r not to be equal to not not to be equal to each other at any given instance of time, right? So now I'm working with a single input to this. Let me call that d. My s and r are not equal anymore at any time. That means I have successfully uh, overcome the forbidden state. Okay. Now, what about memory? Well, uh, as long as my enable is zero, right? If you if you remember last class, as long as I'm as my enable is zero for this SR latch with the modified or the modified SR latch, 
whatever you do for the S and R inputs does not really manifest and does not really change what is being uh, uh, outputted on the Q node. Right? So as long as S enable is zero, that constitutes a memory state. So I still have that memory state. Okay. Now let's try to analyze this circuit. Okay. For this particular circuit, now my, my circuit basically transformed. So I can just box it up. And we call this the D flip flop. Again, or D in this case, again, a flip flop is a clocked latch. So if I apply my this enable signal, I can if I apply my 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 clock signal to the uh, to the this enable signal, then that becomes a flip flop. I can call this a flip flop, and that's my D flip flop. Okay, and how do I analyze this? Exactly the same way that we did last time through the modular approach. So I have D input. Oh, um, let me actually do this. And the enable input. Then the D input. SR, SR inputs. Now I already know how this SR, how this particular circuit works. That is enclosed, right? I have the table or the characteristic table corresponding to that circuit. Okay, so now as long as my enable is zero, what happens? My enable is zero. Okay, that means uh, one of, so again that's zero. That's zero. That means one of the one of the input of the NAND gate is a zero. The output is a one. So that's a one and a one. One and a one for this particular SR latch basically is the memory state. So whatever you do for the D input, which basically determines what your S and R are, that basically constitutes the memory state. So as long as my enable is zero, nothing really happens to Q. The Q value does not change. Okay. Now my circuit, my the, the Q starts responding. Okay. Q starts responding. To my input. In this case, I only have one input, D, right? Responding to D only when enable input, enable input is one. Okay. As long as enable is zero, constitutes a memory state like we discussed in the last class. As long as, but when the enable is one, now my Q starts responding. Another word for responding, a more technical word for responding is triggering. Okay, it's triggering. Because that's, that's how we use it. My Q is triggered, or, the, or in other words, I can say my flip flop is triggered in this particular case when my, uh, yeah, is triggered when my enable is one or every time in terms of clock signal, only when, when that's my zero level for the clock, that's my one level for the clock, okay? So my flip-flop is triggered when, only when my clock becomes high, this, this for, for, for this high level, okay? When the clock becomes low, then it basically goes into the memory state, nothing happens. Whatever I do on D, when this flip-flop is at the low level, does not really change anything on Q. So that's what it means. So my flip-flop is triggered. So in this case, my flip-flop, my flip-flop is triggered, is said to be triggered when, uh, or triggered, let me put it for clock high period. So my flip-flop is triggered every time my clock becomes high, every time the clock becomes low, uh, it's, uh, it's in the memory state. Okay, so when my enable is one, if my D input is zero, okay, my D input is zero, that means my S is zero, automatically that makes R to be a one, 
S of 0, R of 1, that corresponds to the reset state. That means my Q is forced to be changed to 0. Okay. Again, when my enable is 1, if I place a 1 on my D, then automatically S becomes 1, R becomes 0, and 1, 0 for that particular circuit we have already seen in the last class, that corresponds to the set state of my Q becomes 1. Okay. Of course, I don't really need the intermediate inputs anymore like we did last time. So that's my, that's the characteristic table uh, for a deep flip-flop. So what do you observe? So, if, so basically my output follows the input for a deep flip-flop, the output follows the input when the flip-flop is triggered, right? When it's triggered, when the enable is 1, the flip-flop is triggered. And when it's triggered, my output simply follows the input. Output simply follows the input when the flip-flop is triggered. When it's when the level is 0, or the, when the enable signal is 0, of course, that corresponds to memory condition. And, and uh, the output does not respond or to my changes in the input D. OK. Now, let's, uh, let's look at the behavior of this circuit. Now, because now I've introduced the concept of timing using the clock signal, I can be able to look at the behavior of the circuit with the, with the aid of uh, timing diagrams. Okay. So now let's actually look at the timing diagram for this. Let me not do this. Let's keep this here for now. That was D. That was the enable. That was zero. Okay. Um, so let's look at the timing diagram for this. So what that is is basically, you know, it's a plot between time, everything related to the clock. Okay, so, so you're on the timing diagram, the first signal that you would represent is the clock signal because every, now everything is related ex, uh, with, with uh, respect to clock. Okay, so that's my clock signal and that is being applied at the enable input. Okay, that's the clock signal. That's the zero level, that's the one level. Okay. I want to study the behavior of this as a function of time. So on the x-axis, that is time. So your, your clock is, of, of course, is, is, a, is a function of time. It's a signal as a function of time. And that's my D input. So let's say I'm applying some arbitrary uh, signals on the D input. So that's my D input. Okay. I'm applying some arbitrary signal. Because again, that's available to me. I can apply anything I want. Let's say I'm applying something like that. Some, some signal, some arbitrary signal I came up with, I applied on the D input, okay, that's a voltage signal, that looks something like that. And now I would like to plot what my output will be, which is my Q, how my Q responds to D as a function of time. So let's say that's my Q, I want to plot Q. Okay. How do I plot Q? Again, I go back to the characteristic table, I look at the behavior of the flip-flop. right? Now, so these are my memory uh, times, if you will. These are the low times of the clock. That means these are the times when my output does not respond to the Q, the changing Q. My output keeps the value that was previously held at the same value because that corresponds to the memory state, right? Enable is zero, that corresponds to the memory state. So whatever was there before on Q, that continues, okay? It does not see the D input anymore when the enable is zero. Okay, so these are uh, these are not very straight lines. They're supposed to be straight lines. Ah. So 
these are my guidelines that will tell me, that will help me plot, um, plot my cube. All right. Now, how does the cube behave? Now, this corresponds to the memory state. Now, D is changing. Let's say my Q was 0 to start with. So, at time T equal to 0, my Q was 0. Everything was initialized to 0. Now, I see that my D is changing when, when my clock is 0. My D level goes from 0 to 1 during the clock low. What should happen to Q during this period? Should Q follow D? What should happen then? Q was 0 to start with. It stays 0. Absolutely right. It stays 0 because that's the memory state. It does not see uh, it does not see D. It basically the D is the D is invisible to Q when uh, um, you know when, when the enable is 0. So it's almost like you know uh, you have a hole and you're blocking the hole. All right. When D is when when enable is zero, you basically you're blocking the hole. So, so your output that is present on the other side of the hole does not see D. Okay. Now, when I unblock the hole, which is making my clock signal high, when I unblock the hole, my output can see the see the D. Again, so it basically almost you can think about this hole this. Um, Okay, you can think about this as, you know, that's my Q, that's my D, and in between that, uh, I have this, uh, this hole, and this, this particular thing is rotating, okay? So every time, uh, okay, let me not too complicate it too much, but once the hole is there between D and Q, my Q can see the D. When the hole is not there, which corresponds to memory state, the Q just keeps the value that was there. It does not see the D. So whatever ch changes are happening on D, it really does not see the D. Only when this hole becomes aligned with D and Q, which happens when my when my clock is high in this case, that analogy, in that analogy, hole al being aligned with D and Q happens when the clock is high, then Q can actually see D, what's happening on D, and respond accordingly. Because according to the truth, according to the characteristic table, my Q essentially follows D when the clock is high. All right, so that's that's correct. So nothing happens here. Now my my clock becomes high. My flip flop is triggered. My D my Q sees the D and sees that my D is high. So that means it becomes it follows D at this point. Okay. Now again that's memory state. Okay. That means it was previously it was one. That will remain as one under this point. So this transition on D again is blocked because my that is zero. So that transition is not seen by Q. So basically it just keeps whatever was there before uh, until the next triggering instance, which is which is this one. Okay. And then in the next triggering instance, it follows the D. So basically at this point my D is zero, it goes to zero. Then it follows the shape because it can see the D. It follows the shape. All right, and again, that's the memory state. So it basically keeps the value. All this transition on D is missed by Q because it cannot see it. The hole is blocked, and you just keep the previous value. Okay. Now again, the hole appears, and I can see that the D is changing. So, so it basically keeps keeps up with D. Follow the same same shape. That's memory state. That doesn't change. Again, that's the my hole is aligned now again with Q. So it follows the D. And that's it. So this is what I would get for Q. So, so I can I can view it in the form of a timing diagram. Okay. The behavior of this particular flip-flop. Okay. It's a D flip flop. The D stand standing for data because that's typically used to store data. Okay. And I can make registers out of these D flip flops. So let's actually see how we can do that. But before, before we do that, that may, doesn't make sense. Any questions on that? The behavior, the timing diagram of 
the flip flop at this time because we're going to use that uh, more often now moving forward. Okay. Now I can already see some problems here with this particular flip flop. Okay. Uh, typically, you don't want your signal. Okay, let's see. What if Q was one? Q was okay. Let me see. So the, so the question was, let's see. Uh, what if Q is one and then the set command is given? Q is one. Q is one here. Okay, and the set command as in, as in d equal to zero is given. D, d equal to one is given. Yeah, that's exactly happening here, right? My Q is one. The set command is given. Um, but again, that set command is given when the clock is low, so my Q does not see it. So, so just keep that value. All right. My, and then it becomes one here again. And I, I, again, on my D, I give a set command, which is one. And it follows because my Q is, my clock is one, the hole is aligned, my Q can see the D, and that's why basically it follows the D. Does that make sense? Got it? Or is was that, was that what you were intending to ask? Well, the Q was already set at one, and then D equal to one. Yeah, it should it should basically stay at one. That's absolutely right. It would just stay at, stay at one. It would, it would just follow D. My Q would basically follow D, imitate D, as long as it can see D. If it cannot see D, then you cannot you obviously when well, for example here as the hole is moved away, cannot see D. So whatever changes are happening on D does not does not see it. Right? So it cannot respond. It can only respond when it's aligned. The hole is aligned, so I can see through the hole. So Q can see through the hole on what D is, what, what is happening on D, and it can imitate what, what is happening on D. Okay? All right. So, so instead of, so again, we have, so for my D flip flop, uh, so what I was saying was um, there's an issue well, that we need to address again. Okay, one issue is that, and you will see later on why, because my clock is the one that is controlling the timing information in my large complicated circuit. For like a microprocessor, for example, that can involve that contain multiple different modules that are interconnected together. This is the clock that is controlling or, or sequencing or synchronizing the operations between all of those units. So it's very important that my inputs or outputs should not change faster than the clock. So what is happening here, as you can see here, my signals are changing faster than the change in my, my clock uh, signal itself, right? These are shorter pulses than the clock signal itself. That means my signals are changing at a fa faster than the clock pulses itself. That is not desirable. And in, in case we do notice that in an actual device, that basically indicates that that's something that's corresponding to noise, some, some high, high frequency noise that is somehow interfering with my, my signals here inside my, in, inside my system. So that's not an actual signal. And we, we don't want to propagate that actual signal to my other components. I would like to filter out them so that I, I can uh, minimize desynchronization among my among my units. Okay, so that's one thing that I need to uh, remember and need to fix uh, eventually. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, if I want to put some value on Q, a good practice would be to let's say you know if I want let's say Q is if I want to put a value of Q equal to one. Okay. A good practice would be to place on D because my Q follows D. Okay, you put what you want to put on Q on D on the inactive uh, level of the clock. So that's what that means. These are the inactive levels, right? So I would put the value on D during the inactive level and wait for the active level to happen. 
Okay, because when the when the active level happens, then my Q changes to what if whatever is placed on D. Okay, I don't want to put anything on during the active level of the clock on D. Okay, because whatever you do on D, as you can see here, in this case, it auto, it, it immediately gets trans, transferred to Q. Right, when D is high, whatever you do on D gets immediately transferred to Q. Okay, so. To for more reliable operation, I would basically and for, to ensure that my systems are synchronized properly, I would basically uh, make the practice of changing my D value only during the inactive levels here, and then when the active level happens, my Q automatically changes to the, to the value of D. Okay. All right. So those are the two things I need to remember. So one is I need to filter out these ones somehow. I don't want to change more than once per clock cycle. I don't want my inputs or outputs to change more than once per clock cycle. And the, the way I could put information on the memory, okay? The, the practice I would use to put place information on the memory. All right, so we'll come back to that. So now we'll see in what ways we can apply these flip-flops. How can I use this as a memory storage uh, in my microprocessors. Okay. Now, I don't have to represent this entire circuit diagram for D. Now I can actually start using the blocks. So that that's my D flip flop. It contains the D input, Q, Q prime, the enable input where you apply the clock. So somehow these memory units should be should also enable us to. Uh, facilitate timing in my circuits. And that's, that's the D input. Okay. Now, if I want to make a four, uh, if you recall, when we talked about the conditional testing, we talked about, the, we used the term called resistors, register. So these are basically high speed, temporary memory locations, if you will, temporary storage units or memory units that are present within the CPU. So you have external memory and then you have memory that, are, that is present inside your CPU, the central processing unit. So I have registers. These registers are built of these D flip flops. Okay. So why do we need them? Because they can uh, these are present within the CPU. They can fasten up the operations. They can speed up the operations. Okay. And typically, the way operation happens, let's say you have, so you have the CPU, which contains your ALU and all the different registers. And you have the external memory. Of course, the number of registers you have within the CPU is not as uh, large as the number of external memory locations you have in the external external memory. So that's your external memory. So typically what happens the way the process information is if I want to add, let's say, a, a simple example, let's say I have some content in this memory location, I have some content in this memory location. The way I do that is I will copy this data that is present in this memory, in this memory location into an internal register, into one of the internal register. Uh, copy this into another internal register and then I can basically you know add them up and store the result in a different memory location. So I can program it that way using the assembly language code. Okay. All right. And then you can you can have multiple registers within that memory location within that CPU. Okay. And the the so obviously there must be some ways by which I can transport the data from the external memory to within the, to within the registers within the CPU, right? And typically that is done using what is called a data bus, a data bus. What is the data bus? It basically consists of a bunch of lines, bunch of wires, if you will. It's nothing but a bunch of wires that interfaces the memory and the registers. Okay. All right. So what is the register again? A register can be built of these D flip flop. Each D flip flop can store a single bit of information. And I can build a register out of this D flip flop. 
and let's see how we can build one. Or I can so if I, if I want to build a, let's say a four bit register. Okay, all I have to do is I take four D, D flip flops to store a four bit number within that register. So this is that's how a four bit D that's D. Um, D, let me call that D3, D2, D1, D0. That's my enable input. Okay. All the enables are tied together to a common clock. That's my common clock signal. That's the master clock. And these are connected to your data bus. All right. So I have four lines. Let's say I'm working with four bit memory. That means I have that, that's my data bus consisting of four lines. So I would place the data that I want to store from the memory location on my data bus. And this data bus is connected now to these four lines. Okay, like that. And let me take a pause here after I draw this and see if you have any questions. Does that make sense? So the, the process is, that's the data bus, where I want to store some information from a memory location into the CPU, which is this, this register that is internal to a CPU. I place, or the microprocessor place the data from the memory location on the data bus, on these wires. These wires are connected to this register so that, that makes me that makes it a four bit register. Okay. That can store four bits of information, four bit data, if you will. And and I have the clock and uh, I'm storing it. Okay. Take a good look about with that uh, architecture and see if you have any questions or do you see any problems there? Does that make sense? Do you see any problem there with that kind of an approach? Remember, I only I don't have a single register in my CPU. I have multiple registers. That means all of these multiple registers are connected to the same data bus. I don't have multiple data buses to be connected to multiple registers. It's the same data bus that is connecting all of those registers together. And of course, all of them are connected to the master clock, like that. So that that could be a register. That could be a B register. D three. D2, D1, D0. That's my enable signals that are all connected to the common bus, common clock. And all of these are connected to the, connected to the, connected to the data bus. So at any given time, I only want the data to be stored in a single register. Okay, so let me take a pause, quick pause, and see if you have any uh, questions or do you see any anything unsettling here? about the way I've drawn this. Although I did not draw it here, but you can imagine similar connections that will just mess up the entire diagram. So I did not, I'm not drawing it here, but you can, sim you can, you can see similar uh, connection for D3, D2, D1, D0 with the data bus of four lines. All right, so now let's see if you have any questions or concerns with this. Do you see a problem? Or do you think everything is fine? Wouldn't it change to the input at every clock interval? Uh, can you elaborate on that? Let me better understand that. I think you're getting somewhere with that. I, I know what, what you're trying to say. But what you want to say is with every clock pulse, if I change this data on my data bus, these are going to be affected, right? The data is going to be changed. Is that what is that what you are trying to get to, Brandon?
can't keep the same value unless the input is still the same. That's absolutely right. So because you know, I have a common data bus, right? And I want I don't want to have the same data on my data bus all the time. I will be changing the data bus data on the, on my data bus because again that is connected to multiple memory. That is connected to memory, and as I'm progressing through a program, I may be accessing different memory locations or the data in different memory locations. And as I'm accessing this data, that means I'm putting the data from the memory location on the data bus. And again, all of them are connected to my D flip flops here. So because my Q follows my D, after every active, after every high level, in this case, my Q, the data values start changing. Right? How do I make sure that those data values are not overwritten in each clock pulses as I'm changing the, changing the data that is placed on my data bus? So that's one concern I have. And that's exactly what you're referring to, right, Brandon? If I understand from your comments. OK, very good. I hope that makes sense to the rest of the uh, students here. So that's one concern I have. What is the other concern? The other concern is I have multiple registers, not a single register. That means I need to have some kind of an addressing mechanism by which I can say, at this instance, I want register A to be storing the, the value on my data bus. At a different instance, as I'm, running, as I'm executing the program, I like the way I wrote, write the program. I want this data to be stored on B register. So how do I address that, right? So I need to have, because all of these are, att are attached to the same common data bus. That means I need to have a mechanism by which I can address that, okay? That means, ideally, this is what an, an ideal picture would be something like this, right? Along with these inputs, the D, D input and the enable input, I should also have what is called the load enable input. So I have D enable. I should also have something called load enable input. Okay, where this is where I'm applying the clock. This is going back to the data bus. So ideally, my system should have another input called load enable, so that when I apply a zero on my load enable, that means it's in the memory state. So because I'm not wanting it that, that indicates that I'm not selecting this particular flip-flop or this particular register to store my data. That means whatever was stored on Q will remain unchanged, even though you know it's connected to the data bus. As long as my data, load enable is zero, Nothing is being overwritten on Q. If I want to store something on this, that means I need to place a one on my load enable. Okay. And in the next clock pulse or in the active edge, my data will get stored. My, my, my data will basically get stored on Q. Okay. So I need to have some kind of a mechanism that performs like this. That way, now I can have load enable signals for each of my flip flop. So each of these register, for example, these four flip-flops will contain a single uh, or, 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 a, uh, or a common load enable signal. Okay, load enable, enable A, for example. Likewise, this will have load enable B. And by using this load enable signal, I'll be able to basically address which register I want this to store that information. Okay, does that make sense? So I need to have some kind of an addressing mechanism so that I can select individual registers by placing the right input, right, uh, uh, right signal on my load enable pin. And that tells the microprocessor, okay, this time I need to store this data from the data bus on this particular register because my load enable A is on or, or active and so on. Okay, so that's the idea. So how do we do this? How do we incorporate a load enable in, uh, input there? It's actually not very difficult. This is where your multiplexers actually come into picture. Your multiplexers are become very handy in this situation. 
So let's actually see how we can do this. Okay. All right. Again, at an intuitive level, you need to understand how to build these kind of circuits, how to solve these kind of problems with the knowledge we already have. Right. So I'm going to show to show for one okay, flip flop, and you can imagine extrapolate that to the other other flip flops as well. Okay. So that's my D. Let's say A D3. I'm showing it for D3. You can imagine that for also D2, D1, D0. All right. I will use a multiplexer, a two to one multiplexer for each D flip flop. So that's a two to one multiplexer that has I0. Two inputs, one selector pin is zero output. Okay, and uh, I would so that's the output, right? That's the output F connected to D3, and I would place I0 as a feedback to Q. Okay, and that's my enable input. That is connected to the clock, the master clock. Again, you would have the exact same unit for each of my other flip flops that are constituting this register. Okay, I'm just showing it for one single flip flop, but you would have the exact same thing repeated for all the other flip flops in the register. Okay. And my i, my i1 in this case, so I would call this the load enable A. And this I is the one being connected to my D, my uh, data bus, data bus uh, D3 line. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's my load enable. So now, how does this help now? Now, if I want, you know, if I don't want to store anything, if I want to do, if I don't want to overwrite anything on Q3. I would place load enable to be a zero. What happens when I place load enable to be a zero? Load enable is zero. My zero is applied a zero uh, value here. One is being routed to the output. I zero is being routed to the output. Right? What is I zero? I zero is nothing but Q. So my Q is being fed back to the D input. And with every clock pulse, I'm not changing my Q by this mechanism, by this arrangement. Do you see this? I've, with every active or with every you know high level, my D is nothing but Q. I'm being basically feeding back the output back to the input, output back to the input. So really, my Q is not changing, so that corresponds to memory state. Memory. I'm not overwriting anything on my Q. Now, in a different instance, okay, I want to store something from the data bus, let's say. How do I do this? Now, I go back in my program. Let's say I want to say load, uh, you know, load A, the register A, and with the memory, with the content of the memory location M, let's say. If I write a comment like this, if I write a command like this, and it com gets compiled and it gets executed, executed, at the hardware level, what's happening? The hardware level, my hardware places a load enable signal of on A, enable a signal on A to be a to be a one. Once it reads this instruction, it places the load enable signal on A to be a one. One that means I1 is being routed to the output, which is connected to the D3, right? I1 is being routed to the output, which is basically connected to D3. And what is connected to I1? I1 is nothing but D3. Oh, from on the, on the data bus. So the new data that is placed on the data bus is now being fed to D3 and in the next active, active level or high level, Q3 basically follows D3 and the value on the data bus is now written on Q3. Now as soon as that, that is written, I go back and then my, my hardware basically changes back load enable to be zero in the next clock pulse and the value is retained until I come back and want to change the value on Q3 again. Okay. Does that make sense? 
and you would do that exact same thing for each register. So you, for each register, you have a different load enable. So that's a load enable A. For register B, you have a load enable B, and so on. So I can address the register by the load enable signal on the register. Okay, let me take a pause and let's see if you have any questions on this. Any questions on this? Let me see if you understand. Just uh, use some kind of smiley face. You don't have to say anything here on chat. To see, to, let, just, just to get a feeling of what you feel about, about this. Okay, very good. That's good. I want an I zero. I want an I zero. Sorry, no, it, 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 it was wrong. I wrote that wrong. Um, basically, basically, I'm saying for I1 and 0, we always need that to add as an output. Yes, that's correct. That is right. Based on what you select, what, what you apply, nice. Yes, 0, right? For the yes. enable. Yes. For the enable. And one time you choose, you, you so recirculate back my Q3 to D3, which, is, which you can call the memory. Uh, and if I want to store something, I place a load enable as one. In which case, my I1, which is connected to D3, is connected to the, to the D3 pin here. And what is there on the data bus gets stored on Q3. Make sense? Okay. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's good. So now let's move on. Uh, address the other issue of, you know, so now we have, so for a register, I don't have to show individual flip-flops like these anymore. For a four-bit register, I can basically show it as a single row containing this, you know, something like that. And so that's my D3, D2, D1, D0, and enable. And I say, when I say clock, that means you have to imagine, you have to understand that this clock is internally connected to each of my flip-flops. So I have enable inputs for each of my flip-flop. I do not show it in this symbolic representation. You can assume that it's internally connected. Okay, so that's my D. All right. Now let's examine this problem. I need to, you know, because my flip-flop is getting triggered on the high level here, as you can see here, uh, anything that anything on D that happens during this high level is, is getting manifested on my Q, like here on the high level. This this supposed to be noise, but it's still getting manifested on my Q. So I need to address that issue to improve the reliability here. So if you examine the clock pulse, okay, then let's take this out. So now you know what the register looks like. construction of the register. So that's, um, so if I look at the clock pulse, this is how I draw this. Obviously you don't, you will never have, you'll never be able to achieve a signal that looks like that, okay? You can never have an instantaneous rise from zero to one level. You'll, ne you'll never, die. that's impossible. That takes an infinite amount of bandwidth to be able to do that, okay? So if I zoom in on the signal, what you have is basically an edge, a very fast rising edge, but it still has, it's still an edge, something like that, something like that. I zoom in and then likewise, I have an edge like that. So I have an edge called the rising edge. So this is called the rising edge. And this is called the falling edge on the clock signal. Or this is also called the, um, the, the positive edge. 
because the slope is positive, right? This is called the negative edge. Two synonyms for the same thing, negative edge. Rising edge, because it's rising from zero to level one. Falling, because it's falling from one to zero, that's called a falling edge. Or positive edge, because it's the slope is positive on this edge. Negative edge, because the slope is negative on that edge. Okay. Now, unlike what we have here, which is a level triggered flip flop, what if we can design a flip flop that can trigger only on the edges? When I say only on the edges, that means either on the positive edge of the rising edge, not both, or on the negative edge, or negative edge. Can I design a flip-flop that would trigger only on this edge? Because as you can see here, this edge is, for, is, is active for a very short period of time. So you cannot really do much. You cannot have much, many variations in your input during that very short period of time on the edge itself, as you can see here. Here, you know, you have this level that's on for a longer period, comparatively longer period of time, and then during that longer period of time, uh, anything can happen on D, and then all of that is manifested on Q. However, here, this edge happens in a very short period of time, just, you know, as you can see here, this edge happens, although I have kind of, you know, exa uh, um, exaggerated here, this edge, but it's very, it's a very sharp rise, uh, it happens on a very short span of time, and your D cannot, you can, you can expect your D not to change uh, much during that short period of time. So you can basically filter out all of these high frequency components from the signal. Okay. In other words, we can actually see that in the form of a timing uh, diagram, we can actually take the same thing here. And let's say if we design, if we do this, come up with a design, of a edge triggered flip flop where let's say in this case i design a flip flop that gets triggered on the edges edges my output basically uh, follows the input only um, only during the edge or in other words again going back to that analogy where you have the d input and q and then between them you had this uh, this disk, and this time what 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 we are, what I'm saying is now this time we have a very small slit that's rotating, okay? A very very tiny slit. Before we had a big hole, okay? That means the hole uh, the the disk is rotating. The whole, once it's aligned, it's, you know, you have a lot to see for a longer time. The Q can see D for a longer time when you have a large hole, which corresponds to the level, okay? This time, what I'm saying is, for, for an edge triggered flip-flop, I have a very tiny slit, just a slit, and my hole, my, it's rotating, so my Q can see D only for a fraction of uh, time, just, just as, you know, when, once this, slit becomes aligned with Q and D, my Q can see D, but for a fraction of a time uh, compared to having a large sized hole. So previously, we, in fact, I would say not even a hole, previously we had basically what, what, what you can think about is having a, like some kind of a semicircle, right, rotating. So it was, so you can see, Q, the Q can see D for the entire uh, time when, you know, when uh, I don't have anything here. Here I only have a slit. So that's, that's I hope that analogy helps in this case. All right. So let's say I have, um, I've designed a flip-flop um, that is, Positive edge trigger. Positive edge trigger. 
So again, first I identify what the positive edges are. So these are the positive edges. All right. And what I will do then is that means my Q can only see D during these instances, during this positive edges, which happens here. Okay. So that's one instance, another, another, another. And one more important thing is this edges, a positive edge happens only once per clock cycle. Okay. If this is my clock, this from start of the clock to the start of the next clock, this is called a clock cycle. So that's one clock cycle, that's two clock cycles and so on. Okay. A single edge, like a positive edge, happens only once per clock cycle. Likewise, a negative edge happens only once per clock cycle. Okay. All right, so positive edge happens only once per clock cycle. So that's one, second, third, and so on. And my Q responds to D only when the clock, let's, for, the, for this example, for the positive edges. So now if I want to redraw this for an edge trigger, Q edge, or let me pick a specific positive edge trigger flip-flop, what would that look like? So in this case, because my Q, my Q gets triggered on the positive edge, so here, let's say Q was zero to start with, so that the first edge, first active edge, my D was high, becomes high, okay? And then the rest of the time is all inactive edge. In other words, for whatever changes that are happening when the, until the next clock edge, my Q does not see it. My Q does not see it because it's all blocked. So until the next clock edge, which happens here. It's all blocked. So on the next clock edge, when my, again the slit gets aligned with my Q, Q and D, what is happening on D? My D is zero, so my Q becomes Q becomes zero. Okay. Again, the next active edge happens here. Okay. It remains zero until the next active edge. And it notes that my Q, what happens to Q? Q is high, so that's high becomes high and it remains high until the next active edge which happens here. Okay. And in the next active edge, my Q is high, still high, so it remains high for the next for the, until the next active edge. And that's it. So that's my Q. So whatever happened on D, which is basically noise, automatically gets filtered out when my, when I design a flip-flop that gets triggered on the edges, not on the level, but if I can design a flip-flop that can tr get triggered on the active edge, like, like a positive edge or a negative edge, then I can basically filter that out. So these are called edge-triggered flip-flops, which are much more um, reliable than level-triggered flip-flops. Okay, does that make sense? Are you with me until this point? Okay. So now let's try to design one. How do we do this? How can I design one? So let's examine this circuit and uh, do this. So what I will do now is take two flip-flops, two level trigger flip-flops. Okay, so that's one. That's another. Uh, let me put them here. So these are two flip-flops called DM, DS. That's the enable input. So that's D. That's, this is where I apply the clock. And uh, I connect them, I connect, I, for the next flip-flop, I will invert the clock and connect it uh, for the enable input. So the clock for the DS flip-flop is the inverted version of the master clock that is applied to the DM flip-flop. Okay. And I will drive the DS flip-flop, so the QM drives the DS flip-flop, so that's QS. Okay. All right. 
So this because this flip flop is driving the DS flip flop. So we call this the master. And this calls this this is called the slave. So this is called the master slave configuration. Okay. All right. Now So let's take the same example here. Okay. Now what I'm going to do now is so uh, that's the master clock, and this is let's say this is the DS input. I'm sorry, this is the DM input. DM. DM. And this is the QM. This will be the QM, right? This will be this, that will be the QM. All right. And I'm going to also describe or depict what is going to be. Uh, so this will be my my this is the master clock. This will be the slave clock. All right. And um, so let's draw the slave clock. What that would look like. Let me extend this down. Okay. Now, as you can see here, the master, the slave clock is the inverted version of the master clock. So that means if I want to draw the slave clock, so every time I have a zero on the master, that means that's, that's going to be a one, that's zero, one, zero. That's basically the inverted version. So that's, how, that's what I have for the slave clock. Okay. And now I will draw the DS. Again, the DS is nothing but QM, right? ds is nothing but qm that is equal to ds so qm is ds i don't have to draw that again so i will draw i will just draw qs then qs so that's going to be my qs okay okay so now we are looking at ds the slave clock and qs to draw what is QS. All right. Let me take out these arrows. We don't need them here. All right. So this is what I have. And what is going to be my QS then? Again, it's basically if I just look at my DS. This flip flop is nothing but a level triggered flip flop. I've not really changed anything there. It's a level triggered flip flop. Every time my clock becomes high, my QS uh, gets triggered or my QS follows DS every time my clock is high. Again, the clock for this one is this particular clock because that's not the master clock, that's, that's the clock. Okay. So I will draw it now. Okay. Initially, let's assume that QS was zero as well. Now, what do I have here? My, my, uh, ds is zero clock is high my qs follows ds right qs follows ds at this point now that's the memory state that so that nothing happens that basically remains zero that's the negative next triggering level and in this triggering level my ds is one so that means my qm becomes one it remains one until the next. Uh, it remains one. Okay. My D, my DS is not changing in the clock cycle, so that, that basically follows DS. That's the memory. That's the memory state, and uh, so that remains as one. That's the next triggering instance. My DM DS is one. That remains as one. 
That's the memory state. So that remains as one. Okay. Clock is high. My D, uh, DS is high. So that still remains as one. Clock is low. Here. Clock is low. That means that's memory state. So it remains as one. Okay. Again, clock is high. Here, my, D, uh, my QM or DS is low. That means it goes slow. And that's it. So this is what I get for QS. Okay. If I correspond this QS with respect to DM and the master clock, what do I observe? What I observe is If, if I note these as the negative edges, I basically designed a flip-flop that, that responds, if I basically, what I mean to say here, is if this is my input to the entire flip-flop, now I don't worry about what's happening inside, and I start noting down what is QS. So that's my DM, that's the input, that's the output, that's my clock. Everything intermediate, I don't care. These are all intermediate things happening. I don't care. I'm only worrying about what I can see outside of the block. Input, output, clock. Okay. So, if you can see here, what's happening here for the master clock, my flip-flop that I've designed is a negative edge triggered flip-flop. It functions as a negative edge triggered flip-flop. And you can verify it from the time diagram. So that's my triggering instance. Nothing has my D changes, but nothing is manifested on my QS. But in this triggering instance, as you can see here, this, with respect to this, my D is high, QS becomes high. That's the next next triggering instance. My D is my my I'm sorry, my DM is still high, still high. The next triggering instance happens here. My DM, my DM is still high, still high. Okay. The next triggering instance happens here. My DM is low, it becomes low. So in other words, we have basically successfully designed a negative edge triggered flip flop by using this master slave configuration in this particular format. Do you see that? I, uh, so what? would be a good exercise for you is if you can extend that of course i just took one two three four clock pulses if you can do that for let's say 10 clock pulses use an arbitrary dm okay some some kind of a signal okay and do this exercise for 10 clock pulses for this particular circuit okay and see if you are getting what you are expecting to get see if your flip flop actually behaves as a negative edge trigger flip flops over the 10 clock cycles. It's a fun exercise. I hope you will be able to do that. Okay. All right. So we're right on time. So now we have we know how the negative edge trigger flip flop works. And uh, in the next class, in the next uh, class, we'll extend our discussion on this. So let me take a pause here and see if you have any questions about anything covered so far. Any clarifications needed here. Do you see how we have covered, how we have constructed a edge triggered flip-flop in this case? Do you see this? Any questions? That is correct. Yes. However, I will be posting another assignment today. So you can, at least for, the, for those of you who have finished it, you'll be able to start working on that. Yeah, got it. You had anything to say? Okay, so if you don't have anything to say or any questions, then we'll stop our discussion here today. And I'll see you guys on Tuesday.